Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to our live broadcast. We're here in Second Life, in the Deer Park. And here in Hamilton, Ontario at our International Meditation Center. Now the sound is no good. Is that an, is there an agreement on that? The sound is no good. and blurry. I don't know what that means. Is it is it um, peeking out? Clipping? Is that the word? Testing one, two, test, test. Testing one, two, test, test. Sounds fine here. Testing, one, two, test, test. Is it too loud, maybe? All right. Let me know if it's still really bad. So tonight I thought I'd talk about truth. So in Buddhism, we're interested in truth. Truth is an interesting concept, and I'm learning something quite interesting in university, just starting to realize that what we see in his the history of Western civilization is an attempt at finding the truth, a failed attempt at finding the truth, a failed attempt at enlightenment, and they even called this movement the Enlightenment Movement. It was the, and I'm, I'm, I don't really, I'm not an expert on it, of course, so I may be getting it all wrong, but it seems there was a concerted effort to find the truth, and it failed, for the most part. I mean, it may have succeeded for certain individuals who found Buddhism. But uh, it didn't work for the world, for society, for most people. And so then we entered into, and we've entered now into this um, post enlightenment phase or post modernist phase where. People have come to the conclusion that there's no such thing as truth. 
The truth is just uh, relative. Or truth isn't so important. What's important is relationships, heuristics. The individual's place, the individual's thoughts and feelings and impulses, which are important in Buddhism. And to some extent, this deconstruction of um, artificial truth is important, because most of what people postulated to be true in the past, well, in the history of humanity, most of what we postulate to be true turns out to not be true, or to be only true in a relative sense, in a conventional sense. Like Paris is the capital of France, kind of true. Not craving is the cause of suffering, kind of true. And this goes quite deep. Um, the sorts of things we think of as true are, are related to our conception of what's normal. So we fall, we get lulled into this concept that somehow being human is normal. We put humanity somewhere at the center and we think this is true or this is real. And we privilege it over any other conceivable reality and we, we of course, we we have a, a general sense of skepticism towards when we hear about angels and gods and so on. And it's reasonable. I mean, there, there are reasonable aspects of that skepticism. Because we don't see angels and gods, right? We don't see hell realms. But we go beyond that and we think of we think of humanity as somehow or our situation, whatever situation we're in, we think of it as somehow real and somehow normal. When in fact it would be quite surprising if the human realm were the only realm, considering how odd it is, how bizarre is the human realm, how unnatural and artificial, how contrived, how specific. That even if you believe that the brain gives rise to consciousness, the idea that consciousness wouldn't have sprouted up in other ways that are more reasonable, less specific, it's, a, it's, it's kind of arrogant for us to think of humanity. And, and religion has done this, many religions have done this, thinking that God created man in the image of God, meaning we are somehow perfect, which is so far from the truth. If our appendix doesn't show that, I mean, you don't have to look far to see the imperfections of humanity. And so all of that is not the truth. The truth is quite simple. We have what we call the Four Noble Truths. And we consider them to be absolute, and we consider certain things to be absolute truth. Things like seeing. Seeing is absolutely seeing. There's no question. You can't doubt whether seeing is seeing. You can doubt what you're seeing. Am I really seeing a deer there in the side of this deer park, or is it just pixels? Am I really seeing this computer in front of me, or am I actually tied in... Uh, linked into some sophisticated virtual reality that makes me think I'm a Buddhist monk 
all of that is up for debate. But what isn't up for debate is that seeing is seeing, hearing is hearing, or if you don't even like that, going that far, experience is experience. Like Descartes said, cogito ergo sum. There is thinking. You can't deny that. You can't be can't be tricked into thinking that you're thinking. Because you need to think in order to think. And so the first noble truth is is in in some ways just an expression of that, that seeing is seeing, hearing is hearing, that reality is what it is. It, it, it exists. So we talk about the first noble truth in being in terms of suffering. I mean, that's the, the important quality of reality, but it's also just talking about understanding reality. First noble truth isn't just that there is suffering, it's about understanding the nature of reality. Parinyaya. Parinyaya means to understand completely or thoroughly. And that's the practice we undertake. Uh, to in an unbiased way to see what's really true about reality. About seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting and feeling and thinking. About the body and the mind. What is the true nature of the body and the mind? What is the true nature of, of our, our, our experience? Of who we are. So we begin by seeing body and mind, and then we start to see cause and effect. We begin to see how the body and the mind work together to create all sorts of clingings. Kama tanha, bhava tanha, vi bhava tanha. Kama tanha, wanting for sensual pleasures. Craving for beautiful sights, beautiful sounds, pleasant scents and tastes and feelings and thoughts. Or maybe not thoughts, the first five anyway. Those are under kama, sensuality. Our addiction to the physical world. Our addictions in the physical world, addictions to sights and sounds and so on. Bhava tanha, our addiction to becoming, wanting to be rich, wanting to be famous, wanting to be born as an angel or a god or even as a human, wanting to be born in heaven, wanting to, wanting to get a car or a house, wanting to have a family, wanting for something, anything, could be anything, to arise. To be Vibhava Tanha Wanting for something not to be Not to be fat Not to be thin Not to be tall Not to be short Not to be white or black To not be stuck in a terrible job Or to be stuck in In a relationship not to be this, not to be that. Vibhavatanha, wanting something not to be. All of those three are what leads to suffering. They're what make, what cause problems. They, they arise from not understanding the first noble truth, from un understanding the truth of reality. Because as you look at your experience, this is what you're seeing throughout the meditation course and throughout the meditation practice. You're seeing that it's just not worth clinging to anything. You're struggling and torturing yourself, trying to find something stable and satisfying, controllable. And all you're seeing is everything is impermanent, unsatisfying, uncontrollable. You're saying that the nature of things don't don't lend themselves to happiness through 
clinging. It's more like eating poison. Every time you cling, or it's like clinging to a hot fire. And you only burn up. I don't know how to block all those messages. Sorry. And so this is our truth. This is the truth of Buddhism that Craving leads to suffering. And the converse is true, that as you start to understand the nature of reality and understand that there's no satisfaction that comes from clinging, there's only stress, and you start to relax, you start to lose your cravings. Start to give up, give up your desires for sensuality, your desires for becoming, your desires for unbecoming. And with the cessation of craving, there is the cessation of suffering. With the cessation of craving, there is the cessation of, of suffering. If you ever want to understand Nibbana, this is the understanding of Nibbana. It's not something scary or alien. All it means is that when you see something is causing you suffering, you can't help but let it go. Letting go is happiness. Letting go is peace. So there's no sense of making a of mistakenly falling into enlightenment. There's, it's not an artificial state. It's not something you create. It comes about by pure wisdom and insight. If you don't understand the, these four noble truths, even just the first noble truth, if you don't understand it perfectly, then don't worry about it. You're not going to ever let go. Until you truly understand the nature of reality as it is, not as you want it to be or as you convince yourself that it is, but actually as it actually is through watching it repeatedly, through using the four satipatthana to see the body, to see the feelings, as feelings to see the mind as mind, to see the dhammas as dhammas. Only this leads to leads to freedom. And so that's the four noble truth fourth noble truth. The fourth truth. If you read about the four noble truths, the fourth noble truth is the path. The path we have the eightfold noble path and that describes it uh, as its characteristics, but in terms of practice the Buddha related it to us based on the four satipatthana. So right mindfulness as being the key. Then you develop right view, right thought. And that's wisdom. You develop right speech, right action, right livelihood. That's morality. And right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. That's concentration or focus. These are the noble truths. 
this isn't all I wanted to say tonight I wanted to talk about truth but these fit in, these are the core of Buddhism and this is the core of the Buddhist practice leading to enlightenment they're the truths that we focus on and so they fit into this larger conversation of what is truth and so just to reiterate let's be clear that being human is not truth your name is not truth these are these are truths but they're conventional truths they don't actually mean anything in ultimate reality Hamilton isn't truth second life isn't truth this computer certainly isn't truth And so all we are, we are not humans. There's this saying that's fairly interesting, not quite Buddhist, but interesting. We, are, we, aren't, we aren't human beings on a spiritual journey. We are spiritual beings on a human journey. It's, it's along the, on the right track. Well, but we wouldn't be so concerned about the whole spiritual beings idea because that's not really real either. But when you drill right down to what's truly real, and this is how you have to begin to, this is how you have to begin in order to understand concepts like rebirth, concepts like heaven and hell. To understand how reality works, you have to start by, by removing the idea that you're human. This pernicious sense of identity and, and identification as being a human and I have ten fingers and ten toes, right? Since we since we were born from the day we were born we've begun to or even before we're born in the womb we have cultivated a strong sense of identity. I have ten ha ten fingers and ten toes. Arms and legs. We reinforce this throughout our lives. But none of this is truth, none of this is who we really are. And so we have to deconstruct that and get to what's real, and that's seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, and thinking. And that doesn't change whether you're born in hell or heaven or whatever the nature of your reality becomes through whatever cause and effect that you create. You know, all that's real is just this, the six senses body and mind, physical and mental. That's the truth. So there you go, there's some Dhamma for tonight. Just end it by saying it behooves us all to try and understand this, not just intellectually, but to quite simply study reality, study our own experience. We've got all the tools we need here inside. Focus on that and cultivate understanding. Insight. Okay, thank you. That's the Dhamma for tonight. If anybody has questions, I'm happy to field the questions. All right, go ahead. I've heard of the untying of knots and purification of the depths of the mind. Thus, can suppressed or over or covered negativity be expected to be upsurged in order to be cleansed? 
yeah, well, that's not sort of... I mean, this idea of suppression is... Suppression isn't real. You're not actually suppressing something deep down in your brain. This isn't a physical thing. What you're doing is cultivating habits of reactivity that avoid the problem. So it's not about dragging things up. It's just about learning about cause and effect and uh, changing your habits of reactivity. There's no cleansing in that sense. So the knots that are being referred to are just um, naughty behavior, naughty habits, meaning naughty, I guess, in the other sense, of the, the other spelling of the word. Bad habits, those are knots. And so you retrain your habits, your ways of reacting, ways of trying to avoid things, which feels like suppression, but it's actually just avoidance or reaction, redirection. Is meditation on solely the rising and falling of the abdomen a viable practice to engage in for insight? Well, yeah, I mean, that's what we practice. I don't think you'd ask that if you if you were one of us. So I'm going to suggest that you maybe read my booklet on how to meditate. Although I guess, no, if you're just asking that, not focusing on anything else, Right. Maybe this is actually asking just the abdomen. That's what it is asking, actually. Maybe I misread it. Um, so yes, if you just use the abdomen, there's a problem there because you're ignoring large tracts of your experience. And so that doesn't really work. The abdomen's just an example. It's just a sort of a basic exer training exercise and a base to always fall back on. But reality is much broader than that. And if you don't incorporate all four satipatthana, it could work, but it's most, more than likely going to lead you into trouble as you ignore stuff and allow bad habits to fester. I want to ensure that the entirety of my mind is purified. Well, then you should say wanting, wanting, and stop having such thoughts. Don't worry like that. Just worry about what's real here and now and... Try and learn about your experiences as they happen. Don't worry about purifying all of the mind. The mind isn't something like that that exists as an entity. All you have is a reality as it arises and ceases in the present moment. And that's where you should focus your attention and your effort. Because that is where habits are formed and are refer reaffirmed. Or are rejected and taken apart piece by piece. Meditating on the rising and falling suppress things, or will the roots of suffering be eradicated? If you focus on the four satipatthana, the roots of suffering will be eradicated. I'd encourage you to take up the practice of the four satipatthana, not just the rising and falling of the, of the abdomen. So those are two questions that are on our site. If anyone has any live questions, please don't be shy. Lust and greed are not part of ultimate reality because they can broken down. No, lust and greed are both part of ultimate reality. You can also note lusting, lusting, or greed, greed. I mean, they're just synonyms, honestly. Uh, I mean, you could argue that lust refers to a complex it's a little more complex so there may be multiple multiple realities associated or you might just say well lust refers to really intense wanting or craving but i mean there's other ones like fear or, or uh, depression which are a little more complicated um, so sometimes you wouldn't want to say depressed you'd want to say disliking you wouldn't want to say fear also you'd want to say disliking or worrying 
break it up into more but it's not it's not really important to go that deep Fe afraid afraid is fine it's good depressed depressed is fine it, it's it's just they're just words but some emotions are more complex than others we give names to complex habits when in fact they can be broken down to simpler moments of reality I don't think lust is one of them I think lust is just a specific type of of greed in the sense of greeting after desiring after something because you don't lust after becoming famous for example you lust after sensuality generally so just a strong sensual desire generally welcome okay well if there are no questions I'd like to thank everyone for coming out and glad to see people keeping up following and, uh, and those listening to the audio there are other people I think just listening to the audio stream if, if it's up I hope it's actually up oh it, I think it's up and also those people on YouTube tuning in and the great thing about Second Life I'm not sure how long we're going to be doing this but while we're doing it here is that uh, people can just hop on from anywhere around the world. Problem, of course, is there's a limited number of people can come, and it's limited by your willingness and your ability to find your way into second life down the rabbit hole, so to speak. Maybe one day we'll go back to YouTube if we can, ever, if I can ever get that worked out again. Um, well, in the meantime, thank you all for tuning in. Wish you all good practice and. Peace, happiness, freedom from suffering. Good night.